Good morning and welcome to church, everyone. So good to see you today. Thank you for joining us online as well. If you were to read in the book of Psalms, the 21st chapter, the very last verse of scripture there, the the psalmist makes a statement and he says to the Lord, rise up in your power and show your might. Let it be on display. And then the very next portion of that scripture, the writer says that let you be exalted in your power. But really what he's saying is that we would in his power and in his strength, bring praise and worship unto God. And so this morning, that is what we have gathered to do. We have gathered to worship God, to exalt him in this place. If, if you are a guest here today, we want to say welcome you. Thank you for being a part. Thank you for joining us online. Amen. We have much to celebrate today. I shared this in the 9 a.m. service. Uh, this week, we have 12 first-time guests that registered to be with us in person for worship. So thank you to all of you for coming and being a part of the service with us today. Today is also Father's Day, and I know that we are, you are going to experience in here a tremendous message today about the love of a father. But I know that for some of us, that just that thought brings some negative connotations with it. We may not have had a father. We may have grew up without our biological father. We may have experienced trauma, pain, any varied number of things as a result of our biological father. But today, I want to remind you of our Heavenly Father. A father who will never leave you, never forsake you, will never never allow you to go through this life alone unless you so choose to. And so today I say, as we lift up worship and praise today, remember, there is a Father who loves you. There is a Father who desires to shower His love upon you. One last detail for you today. If you are a guest here for the first time, if you're joining us online for the first time, we would like for you to text the word welcome to 414-253-8080. If you're online, you can see this at the bottom of the screen here in the sanctuary. It's on the, on the screen behind me. There are a number of ways for you to connect with us. This is a awesome family. I'm privileged to be a part of this family. We want you as our guests to know that you are welcome to be a part of our family. We have a great father. He loves us. He showers his blessings upon us. He gives us care, and he includes each and every one of us. We want you to be a part and to know that you're welcome to be a part of this family. So before we go any further, let's pray, and then we're going to lift up our praise and worship to our King. Gracious Father, we love you today. I thank you for each and every person that is joining us today, whether it's here in person or online. We ask today that you might show up and that your power and your might might be on display. That today in your strength as we lift up praise and worship to you, that today your love might be felt, it might be realized, and as we begin to lift up praise to you, that we would be renewed with your strength. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
that God isn't going to reach out to us. There's no obstacle, no trial, no issue that God is not going to step in and meet us where we are, meet us where our need is. We have a God who loves us beyond all obstacles, all situations, and all trials. I'm so thankful for the Father in heaven that no matter what's going on, He loves me. That He's there for me, that He wants to heal me, and He wants to help Amen. If you aren't standing, you're able to. I'd ask you to stand with me. This morning we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and we're going to read verse 1. And as you're turning there or getting there on your phones, I want to welcome everyone who's joining us online. And thank you for everyone who's here. Amen. We want to wish a happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are joining us this morning. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1. Now considering food offered to idols. Again, a great way to start a Father's Day message. We know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And this morning I want to speak for just a short while on the topic Pastor mentioned before, the love of a father. Amen. You can be seated. Today, the concept of a father can elicit a wide range of, of emotions, of rea responses, reactions inside of us. For some, a father brings warmth. It means safety, protection. It means love. But for others, a father can cause confusion. The idea of a father can cause pain, detachment, sorrow, loss, and even guilt, among many other responses. And for even more... Father is nothing more than part of the biological origin of their life story. The title of Father is, is filled with joy and happiness for some, but for many others it has a dark and a sad association. And this association has resulted in a, in a rapid moral descent felt all across our nation society. Studies show that both marital and non-marital unions in the United States are considerably less stable than any other industrialized nation. That means that marriages and relationships 
will fall apart here more than anywhere else in the world. This has led us to a place where only 22% of American families are what is considered a nuclear family, meaning it consists of both parents and their biological children. There are 64.3 million fathers in America, and only 26.5 million of them still live with at least one of their minor children. That leaves over 30 million children in America without their father in their life. I want to stop here for a second and say that I am so thankful for the 4.2 million men that have decided to step out and reach and fill that role in the lives of children that need it. Stepped in and adopted someone, stepped in and fostered someone, stepped in and filled the role that was so desperately needed of a man in a child's life. But even with those men filling the gaps, we still have almost 20 million children in America alone with absolutely no father figure whatsoever. And in the Christian worldview, the loss of the father in the home is often listed along with the removal of prayer from schools as key factors to the decline in our society. And rightfully so. Because study after study show the absolutely devastating effects of the father not being involved in the home. It leads to increased likelihood of behavioral disorders, teenage pregnancy, youth suicide, high school dropout, prison time, and many other devastating blows that affect our society today. And all of those are still in effect and still proven to be true, even when we adjust for other influences like poverty and social environment. The lack of a father still affects the home. So it can come as no surprise that today, Father's Day, is a day that elicits a wide range of reaction and emotion. For those who still have your fathers in your life, I understand it may not be easy. Not every relationship, just because it exists, is good. But I do want you to know that you are blessed. And you're also the vast minority in our country. For years, my response to this day, to Father's Day, was similar to the, to the confounding mix of emotions we see played out across the scope of our country. Pain, frustration, anger, loss, and even times of joy. Like so many who are listening today, I'm one of the 30 million children that is without their biological father. And it was this, this reality that brought me to the place that I could finally understand what a father is and what he's supposed to be. Really, if you'll bear with me for a second, my story starts before my parents were born, before, or before I was born, before my parents were married, and before they met. Before they met. Doctors had found an aneurysm on my father's brain. While it did nothing initially, it began to affect his motor skills on a, in a single day. And when it did, his, his parents rushed him to the hospital. My grandfather was a pastor in northern Wisconsin at the time. He was broken, and he called his close friend and fellow pastor, William Sisko, who was pastoring near here in Racine, to help him pray for his son. Brother Sisko at the time had been in the middle of an extended fast and, and an extended time of prayer. And when he heard God, my grandfather's call, he felt the Lord tell him he needed to go. And he left immediately to drive up to the Eau Claire area to the hospital there. When he got to the hospital, doctors had just declared the teenager that would be my father dead. Brother Sisko walked into the room, lay, laid hands on my father, and began to pray. And the hospital instruments, uh, they started, they were starting to unhook, and instantly came back to life. When the signs of life returned, the nurses and doctors rushed back to, to continue their work. And when they did, they pushed Brother Sisko away, and when his hands left my father, so did all signs of life. Leaving the doctors again with nothing but a lifeless body. They again backed away, and again, Brother Sisko laid his hands on him and began to pray. And again, the life returned to his body. When Brother Sisko again stopped, so did my father's heartbeat. In the end, a hospital record would show that Jeff Schiltz had died three times that day and still walked out of the hospital hole. A few years later, he would meet my mom. They would marry Eventually, I would be born, and nine months after I was born, on a February evening, we were driving home from a Friday night youth service, and as we began to pass a car dropping somebody off on the other side of the road, on a small two-lane country road, 
There was at the same time a drunk driver going 120 miles an hour the other direction. He swung around that school bus going the opposite direction of us and hit us head on. The impact was devastating. The steering wheel of that blue Ford Bronco was shoved straight back into my father's chest, breaking his ribs, causing them to puncture his lungs and killing him instantly. My mother would have her legs broken in multiple places, her ankle and her jaw shattered, among many other injuries. Today, she still has the scars, the screws in her ankle, the wires in her jaw that hold her together. And ultimately, her and I would learn to walk together as she recovered in the hospital and I as a toddler. Now in 1979, when this accident happened, safety regulations and understanding was quite a bit different than what we have today. And at the time of the impact, my car seat was simply wedged between the two front seats. When the car hit us, it flew through the windshield, landing in the street. When my mom tells the story, she says she just felt like something told her to pick me up out of that car seat. And shortly after taking me out of there, she saw the headlights coming at us and remembers screaming Jesus and thinks she threw me up in there but really can't remember. But whatever happened when the paramedics got there and they cut through all the wreckage of that, that tore up car and through all the twisted metal, they found me in the back of that Bronco uninjured. Now the final piece of this story was that the other driver, the one driving the other car, and all his passengers at the impact were thrown out of the windows of that car. And all of them walked away with only minor injuries. In the ultimate version of life simply is not fair. When I've shared this story in the past, I, I, I've, I've seen, heard, and re experienced a number of reactions from people. Ranging from, why would, you, why would God save your dad only to let him to be killed a few years later? All the way to, you better make sure you do something with your life because God didn't save you for nothing. And the emotions and the wrestling in my mind as I grew up definitely hit along that entire spectrum. Both struggling with the weight of a feeling like I had to live up to something. And wondering why God would allow this to happen. Keeping me alive, but never allowing me to meet my father. I've heard a million stories about him. But without ever knowing him, all they did was expand the emptiness inside me. Because I couldn't relate to what I was hearing. When I was three and a half, my mother would remarry. And for all intents and purposes, that was the family that I grew up in. I was still and am still connected with my real father's family. But in the new family, I was raised in a very different culture than his had lived in. They grew up in the north woods of Wisconsin chasing down coons and shining lights at deers and deer. It's not supposed to be plural. But that wasn't how I grew up. I was always loved and accepted by them. But I was also always a city boy. My grandparents would eventually move out west to Oregon and would return every year or a couple times a year and visit my aunt's farm. And when they did, I'd go up there and stay with them for a week or two. And when I went there, I, I, I tried to keep up with everyone. Put a city boy in a farm and see what happens. But there was always something I didn't know. Which cow I wasn't supposed to approach from which side when I was trying to milk them which resulted in me being kicked a lot by cows, which bull was more aggressive, how, how close you could get before he'd start charging you, the right way to catch bales of hay as they shout out while, while we were harvesting from the fields so they didn't knock you off the wagon. As much as I would try, my life would always be different enough that I didn't fit in. With my stepdad's family, while I was raised by him, you have the typical issues of blended families. And cousins are amazing at making sure you know that you're not a real member of the family. Now, it wasn't anything drastic. It, like I said, just a typical blended family hurdles that you have to learn to navigate. And growing up in a world where you don't feel like you fit in with either of your father figure's family as a young boy trying to find your place, it caused for me a world where I did feel like I fit in to be very, very narrow. 
And really that was just my immediate family. My mother, my stepfather, my sister. While that life wasn't perfect, as kids we do an amazing job of adjusting to whatever we're going through. And we find a place where we can fit in with what we have. And that's what I did as I grew up. One blessing of, of my life was that all my family, my, my real fathers, my, my stepfathers, and my mothers, all attended church and all raised me in church. No, so no, not, no matter where I went, there was a godly influence. So I was raised in church, always involved or around it, and I learned church protocol. I learned when I was supposed to stand up, when I'm supposed to clap, when I'm supposed to say amen, and when I'm supposed to be quiet. But it wasn't really until I graduated from high school that I can say that I stopped running from God, running from that pull that I felt in my heart. And instead I decided, you know what, I'm going to run to you, Lord. And for the first time in my life, I felt like I had a home. I felt like I had finally come to where I was supposed to be. But like, like life so often does, when things finally felt safe, everything again gets turned upside down, doesn't it? This time my mom told me that she suspected my only father that I had known had been unfaithful. And she wanted to know if I could help to see if there was anything on the computer. And at the time, a friend and I knew enough DOS to be a little bit dangerous, and we got into the inner workings of the computer, began to undelete the emails and undelete histories of what was going on with it. And I'll tell you, it's one thing to hear that something happened, but it affects you a totally different way when you see it. And that's what happened that night. When I saw what came on that screen, when I saw those emails, it broke something inside me. Shortly after we finished on the computer, my stepdad was working second shift at Quad Graphics and he had forgot his lunch and he called, asking for it to be delivered. So my mom sent me to bring it to him. When I got there, him not having no idea about what had happened, I remember how excited he was to show me his office and his work. Took me on a tour of the Quad Graphics facility. And really it was a place that I wanted no part in. I had no desire of being anywhere near there. And after the tour, I remember going back to my car and just breaking down in tears. It had taken everything in me emotionally to try to hold it together while we walked around that place. And in that moment, when I got to my car, the small world where I felt safe shattered. Everything I knew, everything I thought I knew was now a lie. Everything that I thought I fit in now broke apart. My father, my father had been taken from me, so I never got to know him, and I was forced to live in two worlds where I didn't fit. And now the man I called father had broken the very last piece of stability in my life. It was here in this place of complete mess that I began to find hope. And eventually I'd find the true beauty of who a father really is. I remember as... As, as life went on and the days passed and you, you try to deal with the pain, you try to deal with emotions, there, there, there was a day that, that, that was extra hurtful, extra painful. And I remember turning to God in prayer that day like I had done so many times during that time. And I'll tell you, it wasn't a pretty prayer. It wasn't some eloquent words that I'd figured out that I'd been able to share the emotions that I was going through and, and, and verbalize all the pain that I was dealing with. And it wasn't some dramatic wailing where everything just broke out of me. Really, if I look back, it was probably just more of a complaining session. God, I just given up everything to follow you. I just started serving you. This isn't how this is supposed to work. You, you're, you're, you're supposed to work all things together for good. You're supposed to put my life back together. You're supposed to have that good future for me. And Lord, my entire world now is going crazy. I'm struggling right now just to figure out how to keep my head above water. I know you didn't bring my dad back from the dead long enough for me to be born, just for me to fail here. You didn't save me from that car accident for nothing. But God, that's all I have left right now. There's nothing left. My entire world has been shattered. 
I'm supposed to be growing up here. I'm supposed to be, be a man for the first time in my life. Move out of my own. I'm supposed to stand strong in the middle of all this mess somehow. But how can I do that when every man in my life was broken right in front of my face? How can I be what I've never seen? I remember praying until I felt empty. And as I stopped, I waited for something to happen, anything to happen. It would have been real great at that time if God would have sent, you know, spoke to me, sent an angel, something to come from me. That's what's supposed to happen right in the Bible when we're hurting. But there was nothing. I remember getting up and walking out of my room, disappointed. And as I started walking down the hallway, I had a simple memory just flash through my mind. Of years before, walking past my sister's room. She had left her door open. She never left her door open. But it was a mess like it always was. She had a bookcase filled with books that I don't think she ever read any of them. And one of them, a small book of poetry, had fallen on the floor. And it was laying open. And as that memory flashed in my mind, I could see the title of that poem. I don't know that I ever read it before. I don't know that I didn't. But I definitely didn't remember it. So I looked up that poem and the title. The title of the poem was the word If. It was written by Rutgard Kipling. And as I read it, this is what I read. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for the doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster. And treat those two imposters just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken. Twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools. Or watch the things you gave your life to broken. And stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it at one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again in your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve its turn long after it is gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue or talk with kings nor lose your common touch, If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything in it. But what is more, you'll be a man, my son. And in that place where I felt like I didn't know what a man was, when I didn't know what I was supposed to be, where everything was broken around me, when I finished those words, it felt like a salve had been poured on the wounds of my soul. And it stopped the bleeding where I was about to bleed out. And in that moment, I went from pain to a purpose. That simple poem was more than just an answer to prayer. It became a place of hope for me, a place that I could be, a hope that I could be more than the shattered pieces that were all around me. For years and still today, those pieces have been and are being formed into what God desires. He's taking the mess of what resulted from my life and what resulted all around it and is putting it together for something more. And while that's been a powerful experience, the true message of the experience was more than just the poem. It was one that I won't understand until years later when the vantage point of time could help me look back and see what God was doing. It wasn't the instruction about about helping a lost boy figure out how to navigate life. That was helpful, but that wasn't it. It wasn't even a, a, a rite of passage into manhood that every son needs. The true lesson was the understanding of what a father really is and what God is to each and every one of us. The real message was a revelation that the heart of a true father is a love that will always build you up. Regardless of what's happening, regardless of the mess around you, regardless of what's breaking, the love of a father will build. 
Regardless of the pain, regardless of what you're going through, what you're struggling with, what you don't understand, the love of your Father's arms is waiting to lift you back up, to put you back in the place that you no longer even deserve to be. God's love is waiting to put you back together, to heal you, to bind you together, to build you beyond where you thought you could reach, to places far greater than the status quo that we settled in in our lives. In our culture today, the term father, it, it can elicit many responses. But the role of a father can be just as controversial. Regardless of how your family chooses to function, the role of the father today is relegated to simply that of a task filler. Either he's a financial provider or he's a modern day homemaker. In both extremes, a father is nothing more than a function to be filled. When we look at the American home, if the father still lives there, it's considered a success. If he provides financially or contributes in some way to the security of the home, he's, he, he's, he's viewed as ideal. If he gives some instruction in the house, then he's considered an exceptional father. He's gone beyond his expected function. And in this light, we've redefined the biblical role of a successful father that God established to be nothing more than a source of duty and knowledge. You do what you're supposed to do. Give a little input here or there, and then you're doing a good job. Making an ideal father is, is someone who only gives you the tools needed for the family's survival. Just get a, give us enough to get by. Fill the function and then detach. Do your duty, then you can just disappear. But this is not what we see in the Bible. And it's not what we see when we look to God for our example. God just didn't drop knowledge on us and leave us to fend for ourselves. He just didn't give us his word and then walk away. 1 John 3, 1 tells us, it says, See what great love the Father's lavished on us. They, we, we should be called the children of God. Listen, God is not interested in some distant relationship. He's not interested in just giving you his word and then walking away. God desires that relationship with us, a connection with us, an intimacy with us. He desires to pour out his love on us as his children. Jesus in John 14 would say, if any man loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and we will make our home with him. See, the role of the father we see in the Bible is much more than a detached provider. Much more than somebody just doing his role and then leaving us alone. God desires that relationship with us, just as a true father longs for that connection with his children. We talk so much about our relationship with God, about how we connect with him, how we need to reach out to him, how, how, how we need to continue that relationship with God. And that is so true. Uh, we are so blessed to be able to commune with our creator. We're so blessed to be able to talk to God any day, any time. But it doesn't reveal who God desires to be in the relationship with us. It doesn't show us who God wants to be with his children. God's desire for you and for me as our father is for so much more than we currently are. He's not settled with us where we're at. Romans 8, 19 says, For all creation waits with eager longing, longing for the revealing of the sons of God. God is always working on our behalf. He's always pushing us further on. He's always leading us to the hope of our calling, to the fulfillment when we're one with him and we get to live in with him in eternity. And this brings us back to our opening text where it said, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The love that builds up is the Father's love. The desire for, of God for you and for me isn't just to get us through this life. It's not just to get us to help us to survive. His desire is to be the builder of our house. His desire is to be the establisher of our way. His desire is to be the shield against the winds, shield against the trials, shield against the pains that come against us. His desire is, is, to, is to be the light that gives us hope. He desires to be the rock that we can stand on when everything is crumbling around us. It's the Father's love that will hold you firm. Even when all the world crumbles around you, all your friends crumble around you, your family crumbles around you, 
And if that happens, if your plans fail, if everything falls apart, it's the love of a father that's going to stoop and build up a future for you far greater than the one you lost that day. The lesson I learned through all the loss and the pain in that time of my life was that it wasn't really about what I lost. Yeah, that mattered. That hurt. That was real. It, it, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's not that you don't feel it. It would always be part of the story. But because I have a Father in heaven reaching out for me, loving me, lifting me up, he has a future beyond what, what is good for me. The past was simply what God was going to use to build my future. See, God is the essence of a father's love. He's a builder of our souls. And that's what a father's love means. A love that will build you up. As I close and the musicians come, I'd ask that you stand with me if you can. If you've not had a father figure in your life, or maybe worse, You've had one that has brought pain into your life instead of healing. Hurts instead of safety. Then the reality is, is it can be really hard to relate to God when he says he wants to be our father. That thought doesn't come with a positive reference. Instead, it brings us the memories of the pain, the, the abandonment, the hurts. We can struggle to see God as anything more than a lightning bolt waiting to strike us down when we fail. We can struggle to trust the good that he desires for us because of the pains in our past. If that is at least some part of your story, then I hope that maybe today for the first time you can see beyond what you experienced and see that there's a Father in heaven desire to, desiring to build in your life, desiring to heal, desiring to make new. He longs to bring healing, hope, restoration beyond what you lost. He wants to bring you to a place far greater than where you were. For the fathers listening to this message, the dads out there online or here in the service, I challenge us today that we can be more than what society has made us out to be. We can be more than just the correctors, the instructors, or the toy collectors of our home. We can be more than just the task fillers, walking paychecks, or disconnected bystanders. We're called to be the examples of God Almighty. We're called to be the builders of our families. To build up those in our lives. To strengthen our wives. To empower and prepare our children. To build a hedge of protection around our homes that both warms and defends them. We're called to be the embodiment in our lives of a love that builds. This is a love that calls us each to experience the Father's love as he draws us closer and closer to him. And as fathers, this is the love we're called to share an example in our homes. If you haven't experienced the love of God in your life, if you struggle to release the pains of your past, then I'm going to pray here in a little bit. And after I pray, wherever you are, whether you want to stand, sit, kneel, where you are, I'd ask that you reach out to God. Allow Him to be your Father. Allow Him to, to bring that healing touch into your life. Allow Him to build you up to where, you, where He's calling you to be. Allow Him to be the restorer of your soul. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you, Lord, so much for what you've done for each of us, what your desire is for each of our lives. And God, though we've experienced pain, though we may have experienced hurt, God, we reach out to you today, Lord. I ask that your love would overwhelm us, oh God. Let your love wrap your arms around us. Help us to feel your presence and your, your love. God, I pray that you'd move in every heart, Jesus. Let your healing touch reach into every life, God. Lord, as we lift you up and we give you glory on this Father's Day, Lord, I pray that you would be lifted up in our lives. Be the example of who we're called to be. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. But would you pray where you are?